faithfulness, Lord, in healing our bodies and delivering us from evil. Hallelujah, Jesus, for prospering us, providing for us, and giving us insight, a connection with your mind, the mind of Christ. We thank you for it today, Lord. Ask your blessing upon your people, Lord. Wherever they might be this morning, Lord, those that are gathered here, those that are watching over the internet and Facebook and the live streaming, those that are unable to do that but are still in spirit with us, Lord, connected to this body, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your blessing and your favor. In Jesus' name, and everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. And I do thank you, uh, those that are joining us online, live streaming or however it is. We appreciate you being with us. And all of you that are here today, praise God. God is good. Amen. Amen. And uh, we live in some crappy times, but God is good. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Uh, I've gotten to uh, a few times where stupid has gotten so so overwhelming that I just feel like screaming. Anybody feel that way? I mean, like it's just so negative and so just ignorant and you just want to praise the Lord. And it's gotten that way. I was at a, I had to do a funeral. By the way, let's, I'd like you all to remember uh, the Cronin family. Uh, I, Connie passed away a couple weeks ago and they had the uh, funeral service yesterday or Friday morning. And uh, out at the uh, Iowa Veterans Cemetery, and uh, so they asked me to do that, and I was more than happy to do it. Not happy, but glad to do it uh, for them. And, and so the family is, you know, Connie was she loved God. And she was a Sunday school teacher and had a Sunday school teacher's heart, and uh, she's a great. Per she was with us. Uh, her and Jerry. Uh, I worked with Jerry when I. Uh, pastored when we started the church in Ankeny and I was working part time well, I was working full time and pastoring trying to get a church started there and I was working for Eagle Iron Works at the time and in fact I worked out there for about 10 years uh, with Jerry and uh, got to know him really well anyway he became a part of the church there in Ankeny and helped me build a baptistry and Connie taught Sunday school there and then eventually after I left that church and we came and started this church which has been almost 20 years ago now, believe it or not. Uh, they came, and she was a part of the, uh, she was the Sunday school department for years, her and Lynette, and they had just a, just a great, and they had so many foster kids, 30-some I, I, kids, I think they, they helped over the years, just had a heart for kids and, uh, and a heart for God. So anyway, it wasn't as sad as you might think. She was only 71. Now, if you're 30, that might sound old, but believe me. It ain't that old, praise the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, you know Connie, she was upbeat. She wanted everybody to have a good time and enjoy things and just, you know, eat the fat and drink the wine. And this is not a, this is not a sad time. I'm where I've been trying to get to all of my life. And so that's the kind of uh, going home party uh, celebration we had. And it was, it was blessed. And so praise the Lord. But anyway, remember that family. They're doing great. And... Uh, They've had a couple of weeks, obviously, to kind of uh, let this all settle in and, and uh, remember all the blessings and good things that she, she brought into their lives and, and for all of us, for that matter. So anyway, great lady and a real blessing to this church and to me personally. She was, she was a real friend, so praise God. Anyway, let's go to the Word of God this morning. Amen. I want to read Isaiah 54. Most of you know I've dwelt on this too many times already, but so what? I'm going to do it again, praise the Lord. This is a scripture the Lord gave me <clears throat> when I was first uh, baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, however long, that was almost 40 years ago now, but we were living in East Texas, and I can remember praying, and I didn't know the scriptures at all, I didn't know that, hardly anything other than, you know, a few scriptures that I learned as a kid, you know, when you see the pictures on the wall, and you color them, and all that kind of stuff in Sunday school, and I had very little Bible uh, understanding whatsoever. And anyway, I was praying, and the uh, 
house we were living in there in East Texas, and the Lord spoke to me, Isaiah 54. I didn't even know there was an Isaiah 54. The name Isaiah kind of resonated. I knew that there was an Isaiah. I didn't know anything more than that. So I went back and read it. I had no concept of what he was talking about. I didn't know anything, but I, I'm finding out more and more he was pointing to something far into the future that I wasn't in any way aware of, but yet it was so strong in me that it stayed with me all these years, and I've constantly gone back to it and looked for answers and so on and so forth and, and for direction. And this morning, I want to use this as kind of a jumping off place. I've got a bunch of scriptures here to start with, but uh, I want to start with this. Just If you can kind of keep these in your mind, you'll see where I'm going, because I'm going everywhere like Tammy, but eventually I will get someplace, praise the Lord. But in Isaiah 54, the Lord says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is at the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. The mountains shall depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of agates and gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 60, and I want to read verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Praise the Lord. So, uh, I don't know, I talked to Suzanne for just a little bit. Uh, I think it was, was it Saturday or Friday? Friday. And uh, was talking about Tim, knowing that Tim was going to be out of town because of the death in his family and so forth. But we had a, uh, a conversation. It was never short conversations. Let me tell you this. When Suzanne gets in the spirit, you, you're there. Praise the Lord. You know? So it was good, though. It was, it was a blessing. Praise the Lord. But we've talked about this, and T Tammy was talking about it a little bit. I, what I do is I basically just use the Bible. I've read lots of books over the years, and I, I have books. I like to read. I'm not a big internet person. If those of you that know me know, I don't know sick of about the internet. I have to have somebody else do everything other than emails is about all I can do. I've got a smartphone. It might as well be a flip phone. <laughs> it just doesn't do anything else. Mike's the only one that can help me do anything with it. I have to every once in a while tap into his genius. But, but here's what I, 
I've, I've read the rabbis for years. Uh, Hill, Hillel, uh, which they, they say is probably Paul's, was Paul's uh, rabbi, the one who taught Paul. Uh, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, so don't worry about it. I don't speak Hebrew. But, and uh, oh, there's a, a couple of other. Uh, ben Hala is one, and uh, Shemel, uh, Shemel, Shemel El, I think it is. But anyway, they, what I like about it is they, they help you to understand the culture. Because so much of this, we read it this way, and it's not written that way, and so we go through lots of stuff trying to figure things out. Just for example, how we talk about, when I say you, we immediately think it's singular. They rarely talk that way. They were usually talking as a group or as a body or as a family. Same way when we'd, when we'd say... Uh, uh, remember, the Lord remember you. This is something I'd, I'd seen the other day. In fact, I read it years ago, and I never thought much about it at the time, but now it seems to make more sense. But they would say things like, uh, the Lord will uh, remember your sins no more. And I thought, cool. I mean, I'd like to be able to do that. I mean, sometimes people have done things to me. I'd like to just not be able to remember it. But really what he's saying, and this is the, what the rabbis say, is that what he's saying is he chooses not to remember anymore. And because what the scripture says, remember, it'll say things like, uh, and the Lord remembered Abraham and Sarah and had a child. Or he remembered. To, it wasn't like he forgot Abraham all that time. It's when he remem- what he's saying is he acted. And that was his remembering. So the not remembering our sins anymore is God's choice to not act on those sins. It isn't like he doesn't have a memory. It's like he has the ability that we struggle with to not necessarily act on his memories. He chooses when he wants to and when he won't. And if he says he won't, he, he won't. That's the good news. And so he's, tr- he's trying to teach us things about forgiveness, for example. All of us have had crap happen that we'd like to be able to forget because it creates issues, right? It it causes problems for us. Well, what he's telling us is we can forgive even though we still remember. Doesn't mean you're going to, I mean, you can see that person going, boy, you know, there's just, but I can still forgive. I can just not respond to that. I cannot retaliate or not act on that behavior or, or that thing that happened to me. You see what I'm saying? That's what God does. That's what he's done. He's chosen to not respond to our disobedience or our whatever it has been because he loves us so much. And so it's a way for us to, you know, because I've struggled with that. I've had people do me wrong, and I've done people wrong, believe me. And it's hard to get past that sometimes, to to not want to, you know, just get even, you know, say something, do something, you know. And, And what God is saying is, it's okay, Nathan. You can have those feelings. Just it's what I'm concerned about is that you don't act on them. You choose to not remember. In other words, you choose not to act on that or to go there and do something about it, right? So that's that's just an example is all I'm trying to show you here. So with that kind of in mind, that's where that's the way I try to study now, and uh, and it's helpful for me personally. I don't know if it does anything but confuse everybody else, but that's your problem. Amen. So we've already heard it said this morning, and we talked about this. We are light. We're called to be light in darkness uh, for a world that is, and we all know this, it's sinking deeper and deeper into depravity. This is, this is like it's already been said this morning. This isn't just bad behavior. This isn't just evil. This is gross evil. It's gross darkness. If you, if you and I'm not even going to go into it because most of you probably already know, but there's crap happening and has been happening that is so despicable, you can't hardly speak it out loud without your skin crawling. You know, I mean, it's that bad. In this society, the, the, the world that we live in today needs the authoritative voice of God's word. Nothing else is going to work. That is the lifeline for deliverance. It's the only thing that's going to get us out of this mess, that's going to to deliver this world, this nation, this city, this state, this country, this world, everything. Amen? Because Isaiah, he he foresaw and he foretold that a day was going to come when gross darkness would come on the people of the earth. 
And it's described as a wilderness. Just nothing. Nothingness. Ugly. Evil. But he also, in triumph, he declares it would also be the greatest moment on God's timeline for his people to rise up, for his people to be seen for who they really are and for what God intended to do, to shine the light of his glory to those who sit in darkness, he says. Then this is that prophetic hour. This is the time that we're living in. And that's why the devil is doing everything he can to derail the church. Amen? To drive us, to make us think that he has us trapped in a wilderness. That there's no, nowhere to go. Or no matter where we go, it's just more barrenness. It's just more, just more desert, more dry, more chaos. And he's doing that to deceive us. And he's trying to undermine the authority of God's word in our life. The deception is to blind us and to deepen us to God's presence. That's why we're, everybody's got this thing now, and I'm not saying we haven't <coughs> excuse me, always had it to some degree, but more now than ever to want to hear the voice of God, to want to see God moving. It's just it's the time that we live in. It's, it's this hunger and knowing innately by the Spirit that we're going to need to hear God, And we're going to need to see God moving through his word and through his people in order for us to be successful in doing what God's called us to do. The reason that we are here for the time that we're in. Amen. And so he's he's this 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 presence of God, this oneness with God. And he's with us, regardless of what it looks like around us. That's the thing that we're struggling for, because everything around us and everything that we're seeing on the news and hearing and and being repeated one to another and everything else is saying, where is God? I mean, there's a lot of people. If they don't have a real, a real relationship with God right now, that's what's going on. They're saying, is there really a God or does he even care? Is any of this stuff true? Is he ever going to do anything? Or is he just standing by and, and watching us fall to pieces and, and just disintegrate before his very eyes, sickness and disease and, and chaos and confusion and, and the most idiotic things happening that... I would have never believed possible in my lifetime and seeing things take place that, and things being taught in our schools. And I'm thinking, come on, man. I, I, an idiot would know better than this. I mean, it's so unnatural, so untrue, so unrighteous, and so just not natural, not normal. It's wrong. I mean, anybody could see this. You don't have to be a Christian to know that this is just wrong. It's just not healthy. It's not good. And yet, there it is. And we look around us and we're all this stuff. Where's God? Why doesn't he just come in and, you know, slap somebody upside the head and get their attention and do something about this? Take them away. Move them out of here. You know, I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but that's what goes through my mind sometimes. I just like to get up one day and say, hey, they all disappeared. I don't know where they went. They just left. They all resigned. They all just quit. But the devil is trying to blind us and, and, and deafen us to the presence and the oneness, amen, of, what, of, of, our, of our relationship with God by what it looks like around us, by what looks like is totally out of control and nothing that can be done about it. Amen. And God is speaking to us in this wilderness. Praise the Lord. And more than he ever, I'm telling you what, more than he has when everything was going good, to be quite honest with you. Praise the Lord. Look at, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. It's like Isaiah 54. It looks like just constant contradictions. More are the children of the desolate wife. Or more are the children, in other words, of the barren woman. You're, what? But isn't that how God talks? He talks in, in contradictions because he's trying to get our attention. Because why? Because we're in a place where we need something that looks so totally impossible for him to do that he's trying to show us what I can do in the midst of something that looks like it's impossible to be done. God was giving me things that he was going to do in my life 40 years later. 
that I didn't know what he was even talking about or why I would even care. I mean, he, but he gave it to me then, and he gave it to me so strong that I could never let go of it. And I tried to apply it in every phase of my life over the last 40 years, and it just never fit. Because I thought it was everything from revival to, you know, expand the church, do this, do that, and the other thing. It, it, it never happened. If it had been God, it would have happened when I stepped out to try to make it happen. He was trying to say, look, you're reading it, but you're not hearing what I'm saying. You're looking at it through natural eyes. You're not looking at it the way I'm trying to describe it to you. And part of it was just simply that the day is going to come, Nathan, when you're going to have to look at everything that looks totally impossible and realize that that's my opportunity to turn it into something fantastic. It wasn't necessarily about that spe specific thing. It was about life. Praise the Lord. So he says, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Wow. Isaiah 35, uh, verses 1 through 10. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. Really? I'm going to tell you, I've had these throughout my life in the ministry. And there were many, many times I thought, and I, I actually prayed it before God, if I miss this somehow, just move me out. I, I'm willing to go on to something else. If this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing, I'll, I'll do something else. Because this doesn't seem to be, I mean, I had this idea of the mega church, you know, and when I left Texas, I'm going back to Iowa. They said it's a burnt over field. Nothing happens up there. I was prophesied to me uh, by a pretty well-known prophet that used to be at Brother Butcher's, if you guys remember him. And uh, he was big known, well known all over in uh, southeast Texas and Louisiana and all down through there. And, and uh, that's what he told me. He was from Iowa originally. Yeah. And uh, well respected and very on, on, you know, on the mark. And... Uh, being the bullheaded person I am, I just said, well, he missed it, praise the Lord, I'm going anyway. I just felt that's what we were going to do, and that's what I believed that God wanted me to do. But over the years, I thought, boy, I, maybe I should have just tapped the brakes a little bit there and hung out in Texas for a while longer. But nevertheless, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, be, uh, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, where each shall lay grass with reeds and rushes. I woke up the other night, and I was... I, doing like Tammy. I said, okay, God, when I wake up, I'm expecting you to say something to me. So I'm listening... And uh, it sounded a lot like me just thinking random thoughts. But he did say bulrushes. He said tall weeds and bulrushes. And he said there is a, uh, what was the word? I've got? I have to look it back up now because I read it, wrote, wrote it all down. But it said the uh, causeway to freedom. And I didn't know these, I didn't, wasn't thinking about any scriptures. It was just, all this stuff was just flooding through my mind. I could tell you some of the other things, but it sounds so bizarre, I won't say anything until I actually see some evidence of it, because you're going to think I'm completely nuts. But it was just, you know, that's the way it happens. And sometimes, like Tammy's saying, I don't get up, and I get up early every morning, sometimes, anytime between 3 and 5 o'clock in the morning. It's just, I'm waking anyway, and I just figure, so it isn't like, I hear God saying, it's time to get up, Nathan. It's just I'm awake. So I figured, pray now. There's nobody else up. There's nobody around. Now's the time I can connect. And, and I'm thinking, okay, it isn't like I'm expecting that I'm going to hear God speaking to me all the time because I'm generally, 
I ha I'm praying, and I'll, the thought will come to me, which I am believing is the Lord, that will say, uh, you know, you're going to have to shut up if you want to hear me say anything. Because I've gotten, over the years, so into praying for this person, praying for that situation, praying for this, praying for that, that by the time I get through say, going through all of my little uh, routine, I'm exhausted, and then I can't hear anything except the kind of the echo of my own voice. So I've, I've got to the place where now I will stop, and I'm not, I'm not doing this simply because I want to hear God say something to me. It's me trying to communicate and just be one with God, be aware, be conscious of him, you know? And so anyway, a lot of the stuff has come out through that, not because I necessarily got up expecting that God's going to give me a soliloquy of some kind, but just simply because I'm going to get up and pray and try to connect. And if he speaks, fine. If he doesn't, I'll just trust that tomorrow will be the time he tells me. So a highway, sh there shall be in a way, a causeway, praise the Lord, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Praise the Lord. Then the last scripture here, Exodus 13 and verse 18. And I hope I can get, kind of bring this together. I don't want to be like the guy my pastor used to have come preach for him every once in a while. Actually, it was his father-in-law. Great guy. But he'd say he'd take a text, leave the text, and never come back. <laughs> in other words, he'd read the scripture. The scripture was just there so everybody could say, well, he did read the word. And then away he'd go, and we'd never know what that had to do with anything. But praise the Lord. But anyway, God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Now, I looked that up in the Hebrew, and that word harness is actually armed. So we read it to sound as though they were, you know, somehow encumbered or, or locked down. But the truth is, God led those people through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up armed with the Lord is what they're saying. That's the, what they're really telling us is that they had all the power, all the might, everything that they needed, all the weapons that they had to have to do what needed to be done because they had God with them. Amen? So when God rescued Israel from Egypt, he had Moses lead the Israelites by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. Now, it's interesting to me. I don't know if it's anybody else, but God birthed Israel physically the rabbis say, over that 400 years that they were in captivity. He got them to a place where he could make them a nation. They were locked in. They couldn't get away from each other. They, they were stuck that, with that. And that was God's way of birthing them as a, as a people, as a nation itself. Amen. And then that included their enslavement because it kept them. That's one of the things that kept them bonded together, right? And then he birthed. Israel spiritually over the 40 years that they were in the desert. Praise the Lord. And it's the same thing that happens to us, if you think about it. My, my birth took place over about a 38-year time span, 36 years, whatever it was, from the time that I was physically born until I really came to know the Lord. I was in my late 30s. Praise the Lord. Mid-30s, I guess. And uh, he took the next uh, 40 years to birth me spiritually. I'm still in the process. But you understand what I'm saying? When we're, we're, birth, we're being birthed, all that time that it takes for us to become aware, conscious, and open to God. And that's where our physical earth or physical birth ends. Now we are a spiritual being. Now we're born again. Now we become a, a new creature in Christ. But that isn't instantaneous either. Yes, we're born again, and if we died, we'd go to heaven. But the spiritual birth is an ongoing process as well. And for, in my case, it's been going on for about 40 years now. So for Israel, it was the same way in the desert. And it happened in the desert. How many of you know uh, this spiritual birth didn't happen in heaven. 
It didn't happen in paradise. It happened with a lot of crap going on around you. I mean, uh, since I've been born again, I, I've had lots of issues, lots of stuff that I had to deal with. Other people, my own, you know, the, the world itself, the systems, and all the stuff that goes on. All of those things were taking place, right? And so uh, it's, it's true for us, the same as it was for Israel. And uh, the wilderness season, uh, it took that time to be birthed into their true identity into their true destiny, into who and what they really were. There's a word, there's a word called, um, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll leave it until it comes, if it comes back to me, I'll repeat, say it again, but I, don't, I can't think of it right now. But anyway, God could have brought Israel straight to Jerusalem. And that's been my argument all along. God, why didn't you just bring me to perfection? I mean, I was born again. I had the Holy Ghost. I could, I, why didn't you just... Bang, I'm, I'm perfect. I don't have all these. Because there was some questions in my life, and even now the devil will bring stuff up, and I'll think, my God, what was going on there? It's like I wasn't even saved, you know? I mean, what was happening there? And, uh, but, and, and so he, he could have just taken them right to the promised land and given them the Torah, given them the, the word of God, and why not? I mean, why, why all the grief? Why all the chaos and the confusion? And why did he choose the desert for this place of the probably the greatest uh, group revelation to ever take place on the planet. He, for this revelation of God and God's word, he takes them out into the middle of this chaotic mess instead of just taking them to the pristine place, right? I mean, that's, so that's what I struggled with. And, you know, and it causes us to think, wonder, did I or didn't I? I mean, what, did I miss this? Something? What did I, what happened? What created this confusion and how could I have a thought like that how could I do something like that knowing you know why why don't you just get me to perfection and let's move on to do what it is you called me to do amen Moses at the burning bush what does he do Moses says uh, what am I going to tell who am I supposed to tell him to sent me give me a name tell me who you are because they're not going to trust me they're not going to believe me and he, here's, the, here's the word that he used for his name. He said, Iyah, Asher, Iyah. And that means, I am that I am. Or I will be what I will be. And the literal translation, what the, the way the rabbis translate it is, I will be known by what I do. I will be known by what I do is what he literally said to, to, to Moses. So when we think of the desert or the wilderness... Just, I mean, what comes to mind? Hot, dry, arid, barren, severe, you know, hard, forbidding. How about snakes? Complaining. I mean, if you were out there very long, you'd be, you'd be murmuring, man, is there any place for some shade around here? And these stinking snakes and cactus and, you know, we'd be, we'd be murmuring. And the snakes would be after us, and we'd be, com we'd be looking for escapes. Amen? Amen? So it's a dry, a barren, uh, a forbidden place with nasty stuff in it. Amen? And so what is it when we go through hard times, when we're struggling, when we uh, have times of loss? I thought about this at the funeral, and... and, and crisis and tragedy and tears and loneliness there's hardships there's there's problems there's separations and and what do we say well, I'm going through a wilderness right now I just I'm in a wilderness Nathan I'm just really struggling I've been there I, I know what you're saying I, I, I do too and yet the wilderness is a holy place praise the Lord it was in this desert wilderness that God gave his word, his law. And where he revealed his presence, his reality. The wilderness is holy. So you're saying, Nathan, uh, the hard times in our lives, the struggles, the failures, the weaknesses, those are holy, Nathan? Well, I've asked myself plenty of times. They don't seem very holy, Lord. But they are if you're a child of God. Because God is revealing something to you. 
in the Hebrew, the wilderness is called Midbar. Midbar comes from a root word, which is Devar. And Devar means to speak. So the wilderness is a midbar. This isn't really my message, but it, it works with it. Amen? So the wilderness is midbar, a place where God speaks or a place of God speaking, the place of his voice, they say. It's where God especially talks to us. So the logic says that he brought his people into the wilderness, into this midbar, so that he could speak to them. He brought Moses, if you remember, he brought Moses into the midbar to speak to him in the burning bush. Moses hadn't heard from him before that, right? It was just his parents said, you know, the only way to save you, get you in the boat. He brought Elijah to the midbar to speak to him in that still small voice. And he speaks to us in the wilderness too. And so what's it about wildernesses that make it a place of God speaking? In the wilderness, we tend to get focused. We tend to zero in on where is God and what is he saying. Isn't that what, where we're at right now? That's why this has been going on for months now for most of us. It's like, God, if you don't speak, I don't have any answers for this. And obviously, neither does anybody else because look at the mess. I need to hear from you. I need to see your hand moving here. I need to hear your voice. I need to know what you want to do and what you want me to do in order to not lose my mind in the middle of all this insanity. <laughs> Amen? In the wilderness, we get focused. See, we're not supposed to be afraid in the wilderness. We're not supposed to fear or hate the wilderness that we go through. We're supposed to embrace it. Now, can you imagine that? But if we could, imagine what this could turn into. We're not supposed to be afraid of it. We're supposed to embrace it. Amen. We're supposed to draw closer to God because of it, get closer to him and listen to him, hear what it is that he's saying to us. In the wilderness in our lives is more than hardship. It's more than, it's more than problems. It's more than crises. It's the holy ground. It's the midbar. It's the place of God's voice. It's the place where you'll hear God's voice more than you've ever heard it before, clearer than you've ever heard it before. Revelation comes in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Verse 13 through 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan. He's coming through the desert to where John is to be baptized of him. John forbade him, saying, I, had, I need to be baptized of you. Come, comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him, upon him like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Revelation. For everybody that was there. And just like Israel, and just like Jesus, in the wilderness, we have to learn to depend on the Lord for direction. They needed a, a, a pillar of fire by night. A pillar of cloud by the daytime. Amen? We need the same thing. Protection is covering his, his he, he followed them, you know, the, the, he, he was there with them, amen. And provision and revelation and identity. These were slaves. They needed to know they were not slaves. They were something else, but that's the only thing they understood. That's all they had, could comprehend. And the reason for that is because trust and dependence come from connections, <clears throat> that are built on real communication. You can't trust somebody that you can't communicate with because you don't know where they're coming from, what they're going to do, how they feel, what they believe, or what they don't believe. Amen? The more communication you have, the more potential there is for trust. And that's why the root word for desert, or <coughs> the root word for desert is devar, which also means to speak. Without that, 
it's hard to trust God completely for any direction. Praise the Lord. Fire by night, cloud by day. Jesus said, follow me. Right? The word of God made flesh. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Trying to get us to trust it, trying to get us to have communication so that our trust will grow. John 6 31. So he's got us here to communicate with us. Why does he get us out here so he can communicate with us? Because he wants us to have greater trust in him. He wants our faith to grow. Because there's something he's wanting to do that is much bigger than anything he's ever done in any of our lives or all of our lives corporately and the only way he can do that is by our trusting him completely and the only way he can get that trust is by us having communication with him on a regular basis to where we really get to the place where we do believe that he's there we do believe that he has our best interest at heart we do believe that he wants to bless us we do believe he wants to use us we do believe he wants to work miracles we do believe he wants to make a change in this world and he wants to do it through us so our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So we, he wants us to trust him for our provision. You're hearing all this stuff now. People are starting to hoard. People are starting to, you know, go, go buy up all the, uh, you know, the camping pouches and, you know, the MRIs and everything else. And start. And it's already starting. Praise the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord for my provision. Now, that doesn't mean I won't buy an extra couple of chickens or something if I have the extra money or whatever, because I do have a freezer. I can throw them in there. But I'm not planning on my freezer supporting me through some long, drawn-out issue. You know what I mean? I'm trusting God's going to make the way. However he wants to do it, he'll, he'll make that clear to me at the time. Amen? And so he's going to take care of us. John chapter 6, uh, verse 33 through 35. For the bread of God is he which came down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. There's my meal ticket. Amen. It isn't how big a deep freeze I've got because the power will probably go out and then they won't be able to get gas for the generators. And so I better be dependent on Jesus. You know what I'm saying? He is my, my meal ticket. He is the one that's going to support me and provide for me and my family. Praise God. i got to have confidence in that. And the only way I can have that confidence in that is to have communication with him. To know that he means what he says. That he'll back up every word of his. Amen. So God provide, provided manna from heaven. And God will provide his word for us to know how to live. How to do what we need to do. He spoke, right? Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. <clears throat> he said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Name. I started to say that a few months ago at the very beginning, and I lost track of my thoughts here. But that word name is uh, Shem. In the, the, there's uh, one of the prayers that the rabbis pray is Baruch Hashem, or bless the name, because they won't use, the, they won't speak the name. That's why they just use the, why, you know, Yahweh, Ha, Ave, and it's, but that's what they do. They just say Baruch, Barak Hashem, which is bless the name, praise the Lord. Well, that word name, so that we think of it as a name, it's John, it's, it's Don, it's Nathan, it's Jane, it's, it's Megan, no. He, that and what he means by a name is more than a way of identifying people. It's your value. It's your worth. And he's saying, that's what he's saying here. I'm going to give you a name of greater worth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name you or show that you have a far greater worth than you ever dreamed you had. A value to me that is beyond your understanding. It's way more than Nathan. I mean, I know what Nathan means in Hebrew. But it, it's nothing compared to the new name. It has a value that I can't even comprehend. It's the righteousness of God in Christ. Right? That's what he's trying to get us to understand. 
Not only when I when I when you were born again, not only did you become a new creation, you got a new name to match that creation. And it's a name of such great value, you can't even comprehend it. You'll have to get to heaven to know what it is, to know how much I value you. Praise the Lord. Amen. And the desert's a place where the Lord strengthens our faith in him. Amen. That was true for Moses. It was true for Israel. It was true for David. It was true for Elijah. It was true for John the Baptist. It was true for the Apostle Paul. Amen. Even Jesus had to go to the desert. Amen. Isaiah 51, verse 3 again. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Ezekiel 36 and 35. And they shall say, This land that was desolate, is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and the desolate and the ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. The desert is a place of transformation. Praise the Lord. It's a place of renewal. It's a place of redemption. Praise God. Are you listening to me? We need to make this connection here. This desert is what we're in, and there's a reason for it being desolate. There's a reason for it being so chaotic. There's a reason for it being so so horrendous is because God is going to show us this, this, this gigantic uh, contradiction, amen, of what we're seeing in the natural and what he's going to do in the supernatural. He's going to give us revelation of what we really have available, what we have access to. Praise the Lord. Hosea chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. I mean, what, 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 what I'm thinking is the uglier it gets, the more excited I'm going to get because that means that much more he's going to do. The more barren it looks, the more fruitful it will be. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. I preached a message 30 years ago. Probably preached it several times. But I remember one of the first messages I preached. A door of hope in the valley of Achor. Had no idea what I was preaching, I don't think. Praise the Lord. I mean, based on what I know today. But I will give her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Thank you, Lord. We're going to get to what Tammy was talking about in time. Not because she told me anything about it, but just the Holy Spirit works on both ends, my pastor used to say. Hallelujah. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Verse uh, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Speaking of that, coming in here today, this is the God's honest truth. I was coming down east, and you know where you turn off of the, whatever that road is that comes up into Altoona, ultimately, if you stay on it. And I cut across that back road because I don't go down through town in Altoona anymore because it's been tore up all summer. But anyway, I come that back road, and I cut across onto east and come down. And coming down east, and after I got past the golf course, before I got to the Dollar General or whatever it is there on the right, you know, where the stop by the little bar and all that stuff, before I got there, between there, an eagle flew over. And I bet he wasn't 10 foot above the windshield of my car when he flew across. I almost stopped. It just stunned me. I mean, I, okay, I see buzzards, I see hawks, all that. We live in the country, so I, I see hawks and stuff and turkey vultures and all this stuff. I see that all the time. Eagles are rare, even, even around, uh, but in Des Moines. And it was an eagle. It was a bald eagle. It flew right across. I said, Lord, you've got to be talking, and you've got to be telling me something. 
Amen? I, it just literally, it took my breath away. It just flew right across like it belonged here on the east side of Des Moines. I mean, come on. Praise God. Hallelujah. Anyway, the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time. Where in the wilderness she's going to be nourished. And a times and a half time from the face of the serpent. Verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. So it was in the beginning. So it will be in the end. What goes around comes around. Nothing new under the sun. Anything I've ever done, I'm still doing. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the king of kings. Praise the Lord. He, he is the king of the Jews. And one definition of Christ is the anointed king. Praise the Lord. King of kings. Kingdom of God. And he's the king over that kingdom. And he overcame Satan in the wilderness. Praise the Lord. That's a prophetic act that makes it possible for Israel and everybody who believes in him to overcome in our wilderness. How do we do it? By the word of God. By that familiarity by that relationship that gives us greater confidence, greater trust, greater faith for God to do the miraculous. Amen? The desert was intended not to be the end, but instead it was a place that birthed us into new beginnings. Amen? It was their spiritual birth. Slavery, 400 years, was their natural birth. The desert was where they were birthed spirit, uh, birth spiritually. This is we, where we come into the fullness of the Spirit, I believe. Amen. Where we are spiritually raised up. Amen? Amen? Israel wandered for 40 years in a wilderness before coming to the promised land, before they got to their destination. And when their days in the wilderness were over, what did the promised land represent? the place that God brings you to, right? Your destiny, amen? The goal of your calling. The place of joy, the place of blessing, the place of completion where his promises are fulfilled. The type of heaven. All of us have got this. We've talked about it plenty of times. If you haven't, I know it's true of you as well. Promises that you haven't seen happen yet, right? Because we hadn't gotten to the promised land, we haven't gotten to the fulfillment of all of those promises. Some of them we've seen, some of them not so much. Because we've been in a process of being birthed into this full creation, into this finished work of God. So it's, it's where the promises are fulfilled. It's, it's a type of heaven. So what is this wilderness represent the place that you go through to get to the place that God's trying to get you to the place of the journey the place where God's promises are fulfilled so the wilderness and the promised land are two very different places right there's a land of hardship and a land of blessing and rest Here's what God has been saying to me for 40 years. The wilderness is also part of the promised land. It's part of what Isaiah 54 is talking about. If you look at a map of Israel, the promised land, there's the wilderness of Judea, the wilderness of Arada, the wilderness of the Negev, all part of the promised land. In fact, if you check out a map, the wilderness makes up more than half of the promised land. So most of the promised land, you could say, is wilderness. It's a key part of the promised land. It's critical to the promised land. 
So in our lives, we're going to have hardships. We're going to have losses. We're going to have challenges. Fears. Tears. As well as times of, of, of waiting. Or just being somewhere you don't want to be. These are wildernesses. So remember, here's the truth. In God, even the wildernesses can be part of the promised land. In other words, the wilderness is not outside the purposes and the plans of God for your life. They're not random. They're not punishment. They're not even outside of his promises. They're part of what fulfills those promises and brings them to pass. It's the place that God brought you to and God will use to accomplish his purposes and to fulfill the calling and the promise that he has on your life. In God, even the wilderness become a place of blessing. Praise the Lord. Got Isaiah 51, verse 3 again. Now I'm going to give you a chance to throw rocks. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wildernesses like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10. Praise God. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For what? He looked for a city. He looked for a promised land, which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. In other words, he was looking for something permanent because everything he had was temporary. It was a tabernacle. It was tents. He was looking for a, something that, was, that wouldn't change. So what God is saying to us this morning, and what he's been saying to me, is that because he's with us, the journey is also part of the destination. I know I'm getting all kind of juxtapositioned here, but I'm just saying, Isaiah 54, once he started making this make sense to me, it's making everything else fit. Praise the Lord. So your life on earth, listen to me, I believe the Lord spoke this to me a couple nights ago, is part of heaven's territory. It's part of the domain of heaven. So even while we journey on earth, we can be living a heavenly life. And that's what he's talking about it when he says you are seated with him in heavenly places. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Do you see what I, I got goosebumps all over me right now, but I'm just saying what he's telling us is this is just an extension. As long as you're here. As long as you're the new creation in Christ, you take this wherever you go. That's what he told Abraham. Wherever you set your foot, yeah. that's yours. Yeah. Wherever we set our foot, it's the kingdom of God. Whether I'm in heaven or whether I'm on earth or beneath the earth or wherever I end up, if I'm there in faith, there's some of heaven right there with me. And there's some of me in heaven. Praise God. So no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what the situation looks like today, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what our surroundings, he's saying rejoice. You need to praise the Lord and keep moving forward. Keep moving into more of God, into more of what he has for us. Choose, he says, choose to live in victory even now. When it looks like total defeat, 
when it looks like everything that's being sent back to us is negative, it ain't going to happen, it's all going to fall to pieces. He's saying you, you can make a choice to live in victory even now in the wilderness. Praise the Lord. Miracles are going to happen all around us. And God's voice is going to be awesome. Because we're going to get mind-blowing revelation here. Praise the Lord. The wilderness is part of the promised land. So we need to live today with expectation of the promise. And he said, if you do that, then you'll see it. And you'll walk in it. What did he tell Abraham? He said, just go. You'll know when you get there. Go to yourself, he said. And you'll see it and you'll walk in it. The beginning of heaven on earth. As it is written, as it is in heaven, so shall it be on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. I, just to show you that how God will cause things to connect with us. I was watching The Watchman. Christian television show yesterday afternoon. I watch it usually every week. It's a pretty good show. It's, it's about Israel. It shows you the history of Israel. And this uh, Eric uh, Stackelbeck is the one who who's the uh, kind of the MC of it. And he's usually inter he's usually uh, talking with rabbis or some uh, geologists or archaeologists or you know what, so Israeli people. So he's talking to this rabbi. And this rabbi takes him to Hebron, which is actually in Palestine now, but they took it back in the Seven-Day War, and, and now it's kind of shared the, the, the uh, burial place of uh, Abraham and Sarah. And Jewish tradition says it's also the burial place of Adam and Eve. So it goes back a while, praise the Lord. Well, there's the temple or a building that uh, Herod the Great built. And then... Slavic peoples came and over, overran the country and dominated it for years and years, and they added some uh, minarets to it and some other stuff, changed it around a little bit. Now they share it with the Israelis, kind of like the temple. Uh, only this, they, they have access to the inside. The floors are the exact same floors that were there when Herod built it over 2,000 years ago. So anyway, here's the interesting thing. He said, uh, it's uh, Netzah is what, he said, we have it back. We have it now. And this is where our, this, this shouts, it's, it's Israel. It, it belongs to us. God give it to us. God gave it back to us. And it shouts Netzah. And Netzah, he said, what does Netzah mean? And he said, it means victory. And he looked at him, he said, cool. And he said, but not only victory. It means eternity. Heaven. God's not done with this country, I'm telling you. He's going to give us victory because heaven is going to invade the earth. Hallelujah. And we are the army of the Lord. And I'm telling you, we're, we're in such a time as this. God has miracles planned for us, supernatural visitations, revelations of God that we can't even imagine yet. He's given us victory. He's given us eternity here on earth. In Jesus' name. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. More are the children of the desolate. than those of the married wife. And I can go on and on from Isaiah 54, but that's exactly what he's saying. I'm going to give you eternity in your finite world. I'm going to give God to a world full of people who don't even believe in him. Hallelujah. Talk about a wake-up call. Praise the Lord. I, it's, I, if I could say to God, give me a time to live in, I would say now. I know we all think about, well, I'd be a cowboy or this or that. No, this is the time. Because this is where God is going to move in ways that no man has ever seen him move. Amen. Amen.
that we have been chosen for such a time as this. It's the most special time to be. And that's why our names, church, I'm telling you, they have value that we can't imagine. They're already written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they're saying, valiant warriors for God. They ushered in heaven on earth. They brought God back to earth. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Amen. God is good. Ron, you have something you want to share? Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. That is it. Rosh Hashanah. Isn't it? Tuesday? Yeah. Praise God. Yep. Praise the Lord. God doesn't do accidents either. No coincidences with God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, amen. Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee, the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious upon thee, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give you shalom. I declare, I decree your shalom over this establishment, this body, this Tabernacle. Yes. We are the tabernacles of God. This is your moment, Lord. And I stand here in awe that I'm a part of it. And I thank you for it. I speak blessings, blessings, and blessings. Yes. That would overcome and dwell and transform and redeem your people, your purpose, your plan your redemption. In Jesus' name, amen.